This is Lisa Bolakaja, and you're listening to the Break It Down Show. And now, the Break It Down Show with John and Pete. Yeah, you're talking yes. about shrimp and grits. Shrimp and grits. All right, we're Good. terrific. I'm gonna I'm gonna take a turkey burger. Well, you went right at it. I went. I'm looking at it. I was and I'm gonna like, savor the experience of listening <sighs> to you talk about it. Since I heard it, um, f- fries are perfect. Can I get some mushrooms? And that'll be it. Mushrooms. That's a good mushrooms. choice right there. Got to have some of those natural tasting, earthy, earthy flavor. Yes. Now I think I'm going to shift gears entirely and I'm going to have a stack of pancakes and sausage. What's your name? Amanda. Amanda. Yeah. Our server is the lovely Amanda in our patties And I'm supposed, to, I'm supposed to be a vegan. After coming back from Me my too. silent meditation Me retreat, too. we're gonna speak of this and you know not what? anymore. Yes. So this is just our, this is our relaxing. Interlude. This is our interlude. That's right. Our interlude meal. I'd like the barn fresh salad because okay. I just got back from New Orleans and defiled my body completely. <laughs> but then a tiny little, like the smallest serving size you have your chili. I want to try your chili. Because let's not be ridiculous, right? <laughs> yeah. Let's not just yeah jump all the way in. What's that? Cheese up? and onions. Yes. Please. Yes. Okay. Yes and yes. You can't defile your body with New Orleans food. I think I had cheese and grits three or shrimp and grits three times. Super wonderful. God what did bless you, you. you. She's waiting for a selection Sorry, on. Oh, mustard, the cheese, thousands. thousands fine. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The uh, second half of the sentence you just spoke is really crucial because what you said was you can't defile your body. You can't, especially if you're in New Orleans. With food in New Orleans. Oh, farewell with to the food, flesh. With food. Yes. Was the key component to that sentence. Yeah. It was, it was awesome. crucial because. You certainly can defile your body in New Orleans. And Pete can defile uh, uh, his body just about any damn way. I don't know. Shrimp and grits, that's like the holy, holy food. Yeah, it was good. <laughs> it's true. It was good. I had wonderful sandwiches and shrimp and grits and shrimp. Did you get any everything. beignets? I, of course, got the beignets. Every day. Uh, you eat beignets every, every day. day. When you're out there. That's an order. <laughs> we didn't have them every day. But we oh. had, we had, we covered a lot of ground, though. They have this wonderful bar now on the top of the Pontchartrain Hotel, mm. and you get to see it, all of the skyline of New Orleans, and it's just fantastic. I honeymooned in New Orleans, and I've been to that city, which I often call my favorite city. It's uh, the spot. Three times. It's the spot. And across those three times, I've probably spent a grand total of maybe 25 days. Wow. And across those 25 days, we honeymooned in New Orleans. Mm-hmm. So... Across those 25 days, I can confidently say I ate beignets every motherfucking oh one of those God. 25 days. And then you get the classic chicory coffee. Uh-huh. Cause oh, you my do. God. You just of have to say, They go together, and you have to sit there. Yep. Ugh, and they have the best turtle soup. I don't shout out to people who are like vegans and stuff like that, but there's something very spiritual about eating turtle soup. It's delicious. And alligator sausages. Look at Pete and I are fat asses, and you just <laughs> left us behind. I'm just, just like thinking all my like, favorite things Damn. to eat. Oh. Like crawdad season just started when we got. There. Oh yeah, oh. yeah, it did. Here's the thing I didn't realize: Mardi I will Gras, mess with some crawdads. Oh my Mardi god, Mardi Gras is a season. Yeah, yeah, I get it. There's 40 days. That ain't good enough. Like they treat it like Christmas. So like, it no, is. no, no, start decorating now. It's serious right, now. Right. Yeah, so Mardi Gras doesn't start for weeks and weeks still, but. But why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you get started? You can get king cake everywhere, uh, all of it. It's fantastic. Oh, it just got serious. Uh-oh. Amanda, you did got not real. waste any time. <laughs> no, I did not. And you're busy, too. <laughs> yeah. Mm-mm. Man. So we are here at Patty's with the lovely and talented Lisa Bolacaccia. Yes, that's right. Co-host. This is how we met you. I okay. mean, people did, can meet you a, me, a number of ways, but how we met you was... Yeah, because I think I missed the first time you, I, you interviewed with Hillier, and I think I was out of town. I couldn't make it in, and I was so jealous. Yeah. Well, Hill's been on our show eight <sighs> times. Like He's Jesus, all the time. Lord. Yeah. Eight That's times. why he likes to host us. He's like, I just want to be on the show. Yeah. He shows up, eight and times? then we'll have anybody. We'll have an artist or a musician or, of course, a writer or a director. See, my family's a hurt now. He's been on eight times. Anybody... And we'll do it at Hill's place, mm-hmm. and Hill will just jump in. <laughs> we'll be like, we're oh, so, with so an accomplished unicyclist, you know, whoever. Wow. And then, and also Hilliard Guest, of course, <laughs> is joining us, because why wouldn't he? <laughs> and you know how Hill is. He's got an opinion about everything. unicycling. Yes. But yeah, we love him. We've been saying, hey, Hill, 
Will you nudge Lisa for us? Will you have her be? Because I'm right now. I'm looking forward to some pancakes, time. but I'm a little bit starstruck. <laughs> Don't be starstruck. It's just me. I know, but you know how I'm it like is. the hidden hand. It's funny because people laugh at us whenever he puts uh, the podcast up, and we always take pictures of our guests. I'm never in any of the photos. Oh, that looks good. And it's not like you're chicken. No, I mean, no. It's just, I don't know. It's just something there about... There are photos of you in the in the world. I'm sure there are. But it's just like for the screenwriter's rant room, I just like the idea of just being this this disembodied voice. And then you see Hilliard. That way I can just talk more shit and people won't know what I look like. And it's all good. Uh-huh. Just so by hidden hand, what you hidden, mean the is, hidden hand. is the disguised jazz. Yes. <laughs> you're like... You're like Sonny Liston's like, jab. It's like the no, vocal subtweeting. Right, right. <laughs> Nobody, yeah. Nobody what is knows. That? Nobody it's knows. It's a subversive influence. Yes. On the screenwriter's rant room. So basically, what, you guys were like listening to our podcast and it was just like, oh, there's Lisa. Yeah. That's how that went. That's so funny. We were like, we need to get Lisa on the show because you do have a unique perspective on the show. I mean, it's not just that you have, of course, the female perspective, but Hill lives in it. Mm-hmm. And you you live in San Diego mm-hmm. and work in Big Bear. Right. You're kinda all over the place. I'm everywhere. And you have and you've been everywhere. So you have always something to say and something unique that just when somebody thought they knew you, you'd be like, Oh no, I'm into this. And I'm there's something that. extra. I know. I felt so you know what, I got embarrassed a couple of weeks ago because we were talking about I think one of our episodes we were talking about something that someone wouldn't know about you that you'd want them to know. Oh, that's my but they are lovely. Yes. Oh my God, look how big this burger is. And the bun is so soft. Ooh. Oh my God, should I be molesting this bun like this? Mm. Do you want to take uh, a break so we can have two hands to eat? Yep. Sure. Okay, we're just going to put these down. Blue Entertainment. Uh huh. What yep. would you play in the whorehouse? I mean, don't get me wrong. A whorehouse is a terrible place. But so many good things have come out of whorehouses. Hey, I'm not, gonna, I mean? I'm not going to disparage Ray Charles, whorehouses, James Brown, some of the best music, Richard some of the best Pryor. creative stuff. Yeah. Even now, strip clubs and stuff, like, I don't disparage anybody, because there's an art, and there's a culture that comes from that stuff, so probably if I was back in the old days, I'd probably be, I wouldn't be a hoe, but I might be at the door, taking the dollars, uh huh, walking around, Something, uh, right. walking around saying, y'all, y'all drinks good? Uh, Y'all need a refill? <laughs> enhancing the, <laughs> enhancing the uh, establishment's ability to deliver an experience by way of administrative tasks. Hey, some of my heroes, I mean, I'll say most of my heroes have come up kind of on the, like, the shadier side. And, you know, I mean, I think of like Malcolm X, you know, being a pimp, Robert. When I think of Maya Angelou being a shake dancer, you know. Working in strip clubs, yeah. you know. Sometimes people got to do some things, and I ain't gonna judge you for it. One mm-hmm. of my favorite stories about Maya Angelou was the time she made Tupac cry. Oh, I love that uh, story. Uh, I love it. Yeah. Oh, Tupac. Mm. Oh my God, that burger hit the spot. I'm mm. sorry. I'm sitting here eating and smacking my lips with no, these fries now. So let's get back to what we were okay. talking about, and this is just for me to get an editing point because okay. we picked up the mic and talked about that. Okay. Let's get back to what we were talking about. Hose. <laughs> um, not really, but when I was growing up, we had, I grew up in the Bay Area, so, you know, Too Short was around. And I just remember the time that I picked up, when I really, I've been a hip hop head since hip hop was invented, but when it really cemented for me was when I picked up Shorty the Pimp, mm. and on the back of it, I read the tracks, and one of them was simply hoes, and I thought, now this is the art form that I appreciate in my life this time, and it speaks to me perfectly. Well, a lot of those hip-hop cats, a lot of them, they're getting that kind of cultural stuff, not only because it's they're visibly maybe seeing those things in real life, but you got to remember, the Iceberg Slim books, they were coming out. A lot of those books, um, Donald Goyne's books, I mean, I read all that stuff. And there's just something very seductive, even though we know in real life, terrible, terrible thing to have pimps and things like well, that. a lot of those books are about terrible, terrible They are terrible things, but there's and... something seductive about outliers, people yeah. who are kind of like doing their own thing. That's what it is. And it's, 
even as a kid, when I would read these, because my, my stepdad, he had all those Donald Glum, Iceberg Slim. I mean, he had the Playboy magazines. And I was reading those two and the Hustlers and all the magazines because, you know, my stepdad had a garage and upstairs where he had all the parts and stuff. He had all his books. That's where he had a stash. My right. mom wouldn't know where all his stash was. She didn't want to go but up there. She didn't want to go up there. Yeah. So every now and then he'd say, go up there. And I would, I would read these books and I would see these things. And there's like this, there's a certain beauty to that type of like outlier culture. I mean, as brutal as it is, as horrible as it is, because I'm always thinking, I mean, if you go home, be your own pimp for yourself. You know, take out the middleman, run right. your own stuff. But there's just something seductive about that. And it just kind of bubbles up in the music because a lot of them are hearing all those stories from the OGs. And and, and sometimes some of these hip-hop heads, they're not really for real. they just reading them books and using the language. and That's true. And, and talking stuff. Because you can tell, like, yeah. when Ice-T would come out and say some stuff. Yeah. He he wasn't playing like He's that wasn't he, that was that was real. I was like, you know what? I believe him. <laughs> yeah. Other cats would be talking stuff, and you'd be like, eh, that's kind of suspect. But uh-huh. you know, too short. Mm-hmm. You look at too short, and you just go, man, look at his grill. This dude's not playing. Okay. That's back when the grill was just called teeth. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, that's what I now. Yeah. His no, fronts. That's what yeah. I mean. I mean, mm-hmm. it was. It's not. He didn't have fronts. I mean, his teeth were jacked. Yeah. And you just took one look at Too Short, and he was serious. Mm-hmm. Plus, he came up, just his hustle. Right. You know, selling tapes on the bus. Yep. And that is a piece of culture that, you're right, I'm glad you pinpointed it to be the outliers, mm-hmm. because that's that's what it boils down to. It's a segment of the population that everybody is curious about. It happens to be for that, but it doesn't necessarily have to be mm-hmm. for that. Well, but gangster movies do well, though, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because they're anti-establishment. They're rock and roll. Right. Yeah. You know, the, the, yes, they do horrible things. That's people. why rock and roll is rock and roll. Right. Yeah. It's, it's a hot, messy anti-establishment mm-hmm. shenanigans. <laughs> but they're also saying, hey, this system is, it doesn't work. Like, you know, the godfather in the movies is a oh, my all-time horrible, classic. horrible guy to some people, but to his family... He provides something that nobody else. And he's cool to other people. As long as you keep your stuff yeah. together, ain't no problems. Right. Ain't no problems. No problems. That's why I love that movie. Ugh. Yeah. No, it's good. For sure. Ugh. One See, of my favorite is uh, um, The Mac. It's my favorite. One yes. of my classic favorite 70s. Outside of everything Pam Greer has ever done, The Mac is one of my favorite. And ever since I was a kid, I saw it at the drive-in as a kid. And I, there's something about that story that push pull of trying to be good but doing this life i don't know it's just something about it that i did he was youthful too he had that youthful quality where you go man he really could pull it off if he wanted to be good there you go yeah just as a, a crazy uh aside i i don't know how but i happen to be facebook friends with leon isaac kennedy no okay. good shut up i haven't watched penitentiary in many years and he just posted yesterday about uh, penitentiary. Too sweet. Yeah, too sweet. <laughs> you must go. Man, I watched Penitentiary. I think I was probably about, I don't know, 11 maybe. Mm. Didn't the 30th anniversary of Penitentiary 3 just pass? Probably. The fact that there was a Penitentiary well, was a 3 makes ago. me chuckle. Oh, yeah. my God. It's such a 70s moment. Like ugh. That was definitely not something I needed to be watching at 11. I was a little bit damaged. Look, no, no, no. Because you got to remember, all those movies in the 70s, the 70s film industry, they didn't care. Yeah. They showed everything. Like, it's funny because now I go back and I look at some of these old movies like Penitentiary and all that, and I'm shocked because you remember it as a kid. Yeah. But you really don't. And you see it as an adult, you're like, how? I don't remember that. No. And I I remember I have to go talk to my mother. Like, how did you allow me to see that? Like, what was wrong with you? Like, that's so shocking to me. You know, all the the sex, the language, the... There's so many things in movies that can go right by you a hundred. I just realized the other day, I was watching Grease for like the one millionth time. Rizzo comes out of the bathroom with an ice cream cone. Here's a guy in a new relationship. Yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, but she comes out of the bathroom with an ice cream cone. Who the fuck had made that happen? She, wait, she, <laughs> first of all, was in the bathroom with an ice cream cone. Yeah. There was not a whole lot of thought in the right. choreography of this. There's so many weird things that happen in that movie, and it's so great. It's like it's great in spite of all the weird-ass shit. Like, you open the movie with a disco song? Right. Like, what Amazing. the fuck? Amazing. That was RKO trying to make their money. They're yes. Like, here. 
Yes. We need a disco song because mm-hmm. this movie's about the 50s. Yeah. <laughs> a bunch of East Coast accented kids who are all in their 30s. Uh-huh. But no, that's how you get that's how you the subtitle. That's how they suck us in because you remember it came out in the 70s, so that's right. how they got us in there. Like the contemporary sound and then they can ease us into the 50s. Oh my god, I almost I forgot about so, Grease. So many weird moments though. Have you bothered to watch that movie at, in the very recent past, Lisa, in in with your perspective as a writer? And analyze that film with your today perspective on story. You mean Greece? Yeah, or... Greece. You know what? I'll probably have to watch it again. Because now, I mean, when I was a kid, I swear, I'll, I'll, I'll be truthful. The first time I saw it, I, was, I'm not, I wasn't that big on it. Like, I remember I had a friend who loved that. She much went to go see that movie like six or seven times. Now, mind you, this is six or seven times you got to go to the drive-in back in the day. Right. It wasn't like you could just go to, like, walk-in. Yeah. And I, I wasn't really big on musicals so much, but I do remember my mother loved, um, is it Frankie, is it Frankie Avalon? Uh-huh. Grease is the words. Right. Anytime his song came on, I loved it. But it was like there was just something about, there's no black people, so it wasn't like I was like, well, it's the 50s, so, yeah. Yeah, I loved John Travolta. He was hot, that sure. kind of thing. But it wasn't like... Eh. I saw it again, maybe in my twenties. I should go back and look at it again, and just just kind of analyze it now with my my film eyes now, because I probably have a lot more to say about it. Mm-hmm. How it was constructed and all that. Yeah, I'm curious to know. Uh-huh. The other thing is, is I read the play because you can't read the screenplay. Mm-hmm. It doesn't make any fucking sense. Mm-hmm. And when you read the play, it's a lot. It's a lot longer of a show, and mm-hmm. it makes a lot more sense. Mm-hmm. So they're like, this chop this out. It was. They didn't do a lot of care with the. Maybe they just didn't care about continuity and those things back then. I don't know. It makes no goddamn sense. They all that. they had was they just had John Travolta yeah. and Olivia Newton-John, and they were just hot at that moment. Yeah. So I, I think any, it could have been any musical, honestly. And you right. throw them two in it, it would have been. been in at the fair because the Ventura Fairgrounds has a fair in town right now. Let's right. go. Right. Right. But good question. I may have to go back and watch it again and just with my adult perspective, really look at it. You know, another movie from that era that I don't quite get. Clint Eastwood directed Play Misty for me. Oh, and classic. I watch that movie, and I know it's supposed to be great. And it, you know, he's a great director now, but it's just aged so badly. <laughs> you know, it's. it's I weird. never saw it. What was it's, it about? It's got this DJ who's got a stalker, and she loves him, and she always wants him to play Misty for me. And it's, you know, it's just sort of like a Fatal Attraction before. Right before, before Fatal that. Attraction. But it's not very good. That's honestly. so funny. Yeah. Because I remember from that, the the one thing I remember from that movie, I think I fell asleep on it at the drive-in, was didn't they have the song by um, Roberta Flack? Yeah. First time? I, I just remember that sequence. And I remember that's the first time I ever listened to that song all the way through as a kid. Mm. And it's a great song. But I didn't realize it was a great song until I had to sit there and watch it at the movies. But I don't remember the ending of Play Mr. Vermaine. Did he kill her? I can't remember. <laughs> mm-hmm. Does she die? I think she has to. I saw... Which one of the Dirty Harry movies had Go Ahead Make My Day in it? <sighs> was it the second the one? I don't think it was The Enforcer. I think it was... Because The Enforcer was the third one. So it was the one in 1984. Okay. That one, I saw that recently. They had the scene where um, he walked in for his cup of coffee, and the server put a bunch of sugar in his coffee to send him the message. That was terrible. Yeah. <laughs> it was terrible. Mm-hmm. I just saw it maybe two weeks ago, and I was watching it going, man, I remember this being so dramatic and clever. It was it's awful. Fun. Some of those classics that people tout as, this is like the best films ever. Yes. Yeah. They they're, they suck. They don't hold up. They don't really hold up anymore. Yeah. You know. Is that so, because the devices of the time were okay back then and maybe cutting edge? Yeah. At the time it was, because that's when you had a lot more... What visceral happens? stuff. It was bloodier. It was uh, something about the NPA red. It just kind of like it got a little bit freer at that time. So people were experimenting a lot. So you had a lot more nudity. You had more violent things. A lot of blood gore. Um, you had a lot of films coming in from overseas. A lot of the karate movies were coming through. Kung fu, bloody, just kind of like whatever. The and then, editing seems to have gotten better. Yeah, like. we do do better editing because I think we got a, a better handle on telling stories now. Uh, a great example of a film that I think is trash, but people hold it up but now i have to look at it in context and go back and say okay even though i think it's trash just on a basic film level 
the part of me that looks at it in terms of the historical relevance of it, I get it, which is Sweet Sweetback's badass song. Yeah. Like, I remember when they finally had like a copy out. I remember I was in San Diego and they had like this film festival and they had like, this is when they started bringing back the classic movies and you actually go see them. Children, this is when we started getting VHS. <laughs> but before then, they had like a revival. That's how I saw the Mac. I know. They had like this revival, like a black film festival revival, like not just black, but the classic 70s. So I was like, all stoked. Like, finally, I get to see Sweet Sweet Pack, like the movie everybody yeah. was into. You know, mm-hmm. everybody kept talking about it. And I remember sitting there and after the movie was done, turning to my friends going, oh, my God. That was not good. That was like booty. What was that? And then it was like when I started taking like film classes and really going back and looking in and terms of like understanding place. it. Because, you know, at the time, the reason why he got it, the funding and was able to make it was because he pretended like it was a porn film. And that's how he got away with a lot of the nudity and stuff in there because it was an X-rated film. But, you know, he tried to be subversive. But it was funny because I started watching it again like maybe two years ago. And I thought, okay, historically, I get it. Right. I get it. You know what I like better than Sweet Sweetback's Badass Song? The fact that you said you liked it. I'm I'm going with like just because in as a historical I gotcha not just as a historical film but right. in its place in the industry mm-hmm. I mean just for the ability for people of color to begin working in film right. and get union cards and stuff like that it was you know it was a huge catalyst for a lot of people and the development of diversity in, mm-hmm. in film mm-hmm. so. For that, we ought to made, celebrate. Made a, even if it's made a grip of money. Yeah, now grip. in my adult years and going back and just just film criticism, I appreciate for what it is now. In fact, the irony is, I really loved his son Mario's retelling of that. That's what I was going to say. I was, love you know that I movie like better than Sweet Sweetback's Bad. The, the making of it, yes, the making badass of it, was so good, so good, and and it made me. It respect- takes a lot to yes, say that yeah. because I saw Posse. <sighs> And man, he John had a holds big a grudge for posse. He holds a real grudge to dig himself out of after making posse, because that was terrible. I have no comment on posse. <laughs> man, it was because just... because at the time I was so excited. A black western, okay, all right. Sally Richardson. I was a big Sally Richardson fan back in the day, and I was like, okay, here we go. And it was just like, mm, it was just meh, 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 meh. It but wasn't, oh my man. god, it was terrible. Okay, you know <laughs> it was what? Terrible. I'm trying to be nice to Mario. I mean, the thing is, Mario Van Peebles has a body of work that's terrific. Yes, and he made Posse, and it stunk so bad for me. This is a per- yeah. I'm, I'm, this is a personal opinion, and of course, man, I can't. You know, if he walks in the room right now, I'm gonna say, "Hey, thank you for all the other stuff." But <laughs> Posse was so bad because it was just so. Oh, man. So narcissistic. I mean, you know what? I think that's the word. It was, for me, where I drew the line, where I'd had enough, was when they had been sent to Cuba (laughs) to fight. And then when they came out, they smuggled themselves back (laughs) to America in caskets. (laughs) They hid under corpses in caskets to smuggle themselves back on ships. And then they all came out, and you saw, like, Kadeem Hardison. Come, and everybody's disheveled, as they should be. Right. Everybody's appropriately disheveled, just like, you know, things hay in their natural or whatever, and just ashy and mm-hmm. stuff. And then here comes Mario Van Peebles bringing up the rear on his shiny black steed in his leather duster, all moisturized. You can't let him have his moisturized moment. I was like, man... <laughs> You, he let everybody else go out. Wait, like wait. That. Can he have a shea butter moment? <laughs> All right. I'm going to let you let Mario Van Peebles have his shea butter moment. I guess. Oh, my God. All right, Mario Van Peebles. All right. I guess I'm giving you a grace on that because Lisa insists. And if that's I'm just, you know what? I I respect the hustle. Uh huh. No, I, I absolutely do. I mean, don't get me wrong. But sometimes I'm we got to let people know. No. Yeah. No. That one was a misstep. <laughs> but badass. You, but was you know amazing. what? You're going to make me go back and watch it because I don't even remember Posse. Oh. That's probably how, how much. I, that's probably why. <laughs> <laughs> that's probably why but I'm like, eh, whatever. It is a measure of success to be able to say, I made a shitty movie and kept on making movies. But you know what? That's how filmmakers get yeah. better. Sometimes you, you know what? Sometimes you have hits and misses. Even the great ones, you know. Well, I will give him this. He came from the Posse experience and you know eventually came out with badass i don't know the sequence of, of films 
and what came immediately after Posse, so I can't point at him learning his lesson or whatever. You know what? He didn't have to have it. After New Jack City, he didn't have to do nothing else for That's me. True. He like That to me is classic. Thank God for him for putting Wesley Snipes, mm-hmm. I am my Russell Wong. You know oh, my I God. Mean? Russell Wong. And that was such a all, Oh, my God. And Chris you Rock. You make a bad movie because maybe you know, there's too many people trying to make sure he makes it right. So there's too many people involved and in, yeah. learn the lesson of control or whatever mm-hmm. it was going to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, maybe he just punted one. But he's got other good movies and other good work, and he's done not just the movie part, but, yeah, the social responsibility mm-hmm. part of it. And that counts. And the fact is, the reason that I talk about this is all at all is because I've made two films, and they both stunk. That's <laughs> how both, you learn. They're both terrible. But you know what? That's how you learn. Let's hope. <laughs> Jesus. <That's- laughs> Wait, are these films available for us to see on YouTube? They are. No, I don't know if you they're You've got to go YouTube. to Thailand to get I gotta, them, though. Yeah. I gotta go to Thailand. Oh, I yeah, got. I want to go to. I want to go to Thailand. One of the two. No, I want to go to Thailand. That way. Yeah. I can you be in a beautiful. I can have be in a beautiful place. Right. And if it really is that bad, it's yeah. okay because I'm in a beautiful place. Yeah. You're getting a foot massage. <laughs> you know what I mean? This this is the type of movie that needs to be accompanied by a foot massage. <laughs> that bad? It's okay. It can't be that bad. And you know, I don't mean to disparage my filmmaking partner, the director. Sean Sargosi, because he had visions that were great. But we were kids, and we were learning See, things. See, you were babies. You were learning. And I'll tell you, if if there's anything in his vision that was flawed, it was that his invi- his vision involved incorporating me. <laughs> um, Wait, what was the name the of the plan? movie again? So we had a film that came out in 1995 called um, The Middleman, and then a film that came out in 2006. Mm-hmm called Premonitions. So John's due for his next movie. I am due. Wait, was Premonitions a horror movie? It was a thriller. It came out just before a movie called Premonitions that had Sandra Bullock in it. Yeah, yeah. Hers was called Premonition. And ours came first, so I'll give it that. But theirs came harder. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's, there's, <laughs> actually, theirs came at all. Oh my God. Ours was largely <laughs> unfulfilled. <laughs> um, oh my God. John and Pete. Hey everybody, if you like the Break It Down show, I can dig it. and of course you do, of course you do. hit that subscribe button. John and Pete. It helps us out. Hey, if you're going to like the show on Facebook or on Twitter, it helps us out if you share the show so people can learn about it. So liking it is great, sharing is even better. Let's do some spy stuff. Yeah, just let's get all our friends' phones and have them subscribe to the Break It Down Show. Do it. Subscribe. Listen to the show. If you love the show, tell five of your friends. Or if you hate the show, tell five of your friends. Can can I just say I'm enjoying doing this podcast where I can eat and drink? Oh, good. We're enjoying having you. And being being out in sunlight and talking film and fabulousness. We knew you'd yeah. be an amazing guest because... You know what? I don't think I've said much because I've just, we've just been talking about film stuff that's like cool, corny do. stuff. That's just like stuff that I'm into, like that kind of nerdy film. This is what we do, though. We let the person be the person. We don't really do an interview show. We do a conversation. There you go. And Which is kind of like what me and Hillary do on the yeah, rant absolutely. room. Just have a conversation. We do absolutely... Um, I think I, I won't say we model ourselves after your show as much as we have taken what we really enjoy about your show as a really strong influence. And oh, awesome. We can't help but do that because we have almost like we've been mentored by Hilliard in a lot of ways. Okay. He gives us just sometimes the most elementary tips like, mm-hmm. hey, this hard table, mm-hmm. throw a blanket down on it. Right. They make a difference. Yeah. You have, to, le- he, he have to learn it, too. And that's one of the things that's really great about Hilliard is learn something. Passing on and everybody else. Can I tell you what I hate about Hilliard? Yes, go ahead. What annoys me. Okay, what annoys you? He looks so damn good. Look, (laughs) do you know how many times I hate coming up into this office Mm -hmm. on the lot? I walk in. He has the best looking legs. Like his calves, his ankles. Like sometimes. proportionate. Look, look, sometimes I feel like I just want to just take a stick and just beat his legs Uh and beat him down. And not tell anybody? Uh-huh. Because things would just be, like, tight you and proper. I, you know, I think these thoughts, you know, I'll be looking at him. Things are just lined up. So, you know what? 
I'm gonna have to hurt that man. It's all symmetrical. I know. You know what I mean? I know. Chiseled. I am so glad you feel my not. pain. You feel my pain when I walk in there. I am a straight man. I am a married. <sighs> I love my wife. But if I was to swing the other way, I, my first oh call my would God. be Hill. Oh my I'd God. I say, Hill, you know what? Oh my Bring God. Bring them calves over here. <laughs> <laughs> swing them calves this way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You see this Achilles. I am so glad that there's someone else here who feels no, my pain. No, he takes such great care of himself, though. But then he has a damn nerve to put, like, candy and, like, yes, really he does. bad snacks when he's doing it. And he knows. He knows. And he'll sit there with his little, like... Sabotage all the rest yeah, of Yeah, yeah, yeah. He'll have, like, a little, his, help, his healthy little drinks and his little, his little mm-hmm. like... I'm going to drink spirulina yes! while I offer you a Reese's and peanut butter cup. And he'll, have, like, <laughs> and he'll have, like, Twizzlers sitting in the middle of the table. It's like, oh, God, it's just... It's so wrong. It's terrible. It's terrible. Hilliard, shoot yourself. And the calves. <laughs> he, uh, in all seriousness, takes such good care of himself that every time we come to see him, we're overjoyed. We're like, hey, it's so nice to see you. And then, you know, give him a hug. Hey, man, it's really nice to see you. It's good seeing you again. And I think, ah, oh, this is right now is where I remind myself I take inventory of all the sit ups I did not do. Right, right. <laughs> That's what Hill reminds me of. Things I need to be doing. He reminds me of them damn crunches I owe myself because I had a hot meal. I know. I know. And coconut cream pie. And coconut, coconut cream pie. And coconut cakes. Uh-huh. Ordering this shit, having the nerve. You know what? But you know what? It's it's a holiday today, so we can enjoy this. It is. We can enjoy it. How come we are celebrating the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday by ordering the two whitest things White on the stuff. Menu? You know what? We are a multicultural nation. That's right. <laughs> we are. That's right. <laughs> what we're doing is being inclusive. And uh, I would just say this is part of my Italian and French side of my family. So I will enjoy this coconut cream cake, whatever this is, because it is really good. How in touch with your Italian and... I go to Italy almost every summer. Oh, do you? Yes. My siblings live there. My niece and nephew are there. Okay. Uh, my grandmother was there, but she passed away a couple years ago before I could make it back over there to go see her one more time. Whenever I get a chance to get out of the United States, I go I go to Firenze, Florence, for those of you who don't know. And I bounce between Rome, Florence, and Milan. And um, we Do eat. Do you ever run into Kobe Bryant? I try not to. Oh, okay. <laughs> you can't miss him when he's there. I guess. But <laughs> I try not to. That's the place that you unplug... And that's the place that I go eat real good, authentic Italian food. Mm. And my sister and my brother-in-law, they make fantastic wine. My brother is a fantastic chef. He He's like a, he works in this bar in this fancy hotel and he makes the best drinks ever. Like fresh with the fresh herbs and mint. Oh my God. He is like a master. Like they wrote him up in this Italian magazine and I'm like, oh, that's my brother. Hi, Kiko. Yeah. So I'm there like. Typically, I try to go over summer or every other summer. Uh-huh. The French side, well, whenever I get to get down to New Orleans, go see friends and family down there, I try to. But, yes, I get over there and I turn very European when I'm in Italy. <laughs> I bet. I bet. <laughs> I think that's one of the things that we like about your comments and commentary on the show in general is, you know, you do have a cosmopolitan viewpoint. Hmm. You are all over the place. And I snatch up everybody. Like, if they wrong, no matter what ethnicity they are in this part of me, I'm snatching them they're up and I'm, they're going to get corrected regardless, huh. you know. It's it's the same with the native side of our family. We, you know, we support and love and all that stuff too, but if I need to call some stuff out, yeah, I will do it and will not be afraid to, to say so. But it's interesting to get the perspective of my siblings who were raised pretty much in Italy and they're very, very Italian. Yeah, like through they through. Both of them recently, I want to say... <sighs> had a really good mastery of English probably when they were maybe 10 or 11. Uh So they're trilingual. I'm the only one of our family who's not a monolingual. That's because I was raised in America. And in America, they tell you that English is the language that everyone needs to know. And that's all you need to do. And I regret this now because I wish I would have been able to like learn a lot more, especially living in Southern Cali. Oh my God, I live right on the Mexican border. Yeah. Are you kidding me? But, you know, a lot of the kids grow up thinking you got to learn English and that's it. One of the things I do enjoy is, is, is people who speak many languages, because I think people who can speak many languages are smarter because their brains are doing a lot more work. Yeah. They're firing on more cylinders. And yeah, they're more cylinders. And I think, you know, I don't know. They just, it's just something about 
having a respect for different cultures and traveling outside the U.S. and watching films outside the U.S. Yep. and watching a lot of indie films from all over. I don't know. It just makes you a more Stories aware are told person. differently in yes. different cultures. The thing yes. about different languages and the understanding different languages is that you have sayings that create an emphasis on a particular feeling about people. Right. That becomes important. Mm -hmm. And when you understand more of those things, it makes your brain operate differently yes. when you analyze the way things work. Right. You have more perspective. Right. You have a wider understanding that allows you to see the mechanisms that lead to whatever right. outcome you're looking at. Right. And it just makes for a more interesting person, too. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what I do. Like, a lot of my work now, the slush pile is opening up because I do, besides writing film critiques at Bitch Licks, I also read slush for Apex Science Fiction Magazine. So we're opening up our submissions now. And I love reading stories from different places that are just so outside of my realm of what? What is this? It just makes it more amazing. It makes me want to be a better writer. It's just I'm excited about some of the new stuff that's going to be coming in from writers who are writing fantasy and horror and really good sci-fi. Because one of the, the best sci-fi movies that came out this year, and I'm not saying it to brag, but I'm going to say it to brag anyway, was written by my teacher when I was at Clarion, oh. Ted Chang. Mm. The GOAT, his short story, Story of Your Life, became a rival with Amy Adams in it. And that is one of those sci-fi movies. It's like a really cerebral, smart sci-fi. And a lot of people were mad because it wasn't like shoot-up spacemen, that kind of stuff. And I'm more interested in sci-fi that... I don't know, it just takes you out of what you're not. I mean, we don't all need a 20,000 Independence Day movies. Yeah. There can be some really, really intelligent sci-fi that's coming out. And so I was really excited when Arrival was just how I wished it would be. Because I was really worried. That's like my favorite short story from Ted Chang. And whenever people are adapting, it's a difficult story to adapt, I thought. But I think the, the writer did an excellent job because it got to the essence of what made that story so powerful. Can I tell you, I didn't like that movie And at it's all. okay. No, no. And that's okay. Yeah. A lot of my friends hated it. I, I, th I felt like maybe that adaptation didn't work for me, but mm -hmm. there was so much greatness in the last four minutes of the movie. I know. Why didn't they put that story in, Or it was like they changed their mind. Go read the short story. I, I, will, I will. Read the short I will, story. Sure. And it really see. Me. Could, but it, yeah. Go ahead. I was just, I wanted, I, I trust, I trust Amy Adams. Mm -hmm. Like, this is kind of how I, I watch movies a lot of times. Like, oh. I already know that I, I am powerless against Tom Hanks. <laughs> Whatever he says or does, I believe it completely. You know? He's like, Pete, you like poo. And I'm like, I like poo. I like poo. Like, nothing I can do about it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so I, I trust Amy Adams not uh -huh. that much, but uh -huh. I, I, she really let me down. And I'm like, oh, man, I wanted this movie to be better. And Is it the material or was it the acting or what do you, what a combination of everything? The story. The story itself. The story. I, I didn't need to shoot him up. I'm fine with that. I really enjoyed the other uh, sci fi movie. With Chris Pratt and Jennifer Lawrence. What's that movie called? Oh, Passengers. Yeah, Pat, I really enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. you know, the arrival, I just couldn't get that. I'm like, why didn't you tell me that story at the end the whole time? Mm -hmm. Instead of making all this tension, it didn't, it didn't do anything. And then give you a good payoff for you. Yeah, yeah, what did yeah. you think about the aliens in it? Were they unique enough? or They were okay. They, I was waiting for a payoff. I really was. Okay. Like, half with you, I'm like, they better pay off. Mm -hmm. You've built all this. And then when it got there, I'm like... That was the story I wanted to see the whole time. This is so much better than the, I'm going into this spaceship. Ooh, what's going to happen in the spaceship? Okay, they're going to stand there. Okay. Oh, and then they're going to leave. Okay. And Interesting. Gonna, no, no, because a lot of my friends who didn't like it were saying the same thing. Yeah. They were just like, mm. oh, there's the army guy. He's going to, oh, no, he's nope. not going to do anything. And so it just, yeah, it bothered me that the, the, the payoff just didn't come through. Mm -hmm. and yeah, I just didn't enjoy it. Did you see it? No. Okay. That's why I'm over here sitting quietly. <laughs> like, I was going to jump into a few minutes ago. We okay. talked about seeing foreign movies. And uh, because I've worked overseas a lot, I've seen I, I've seen like every movie. So right. You start looking at the foreign films. And one of the things I noticed. Is this helicopter going by? The spy satellite. It's a nice helicopter. Well, it's kind of fancy. One of the things I've noticed, and this is just my perception. Maybe it's completely wrong. But a lot of the Scandinavian movies. Use different tools and devices to tell the story. One, no one's going to take their clothes off. So nudity and everything, this doesn't really drive the movie ever. Mm -hmm. It's not like a, oh, there's the girl in the shower scene or none right, of those right. kind of things. Right. And then when they do take their clothes off, their bodies are very normal. Because if you're in I Scandinavia. Love, I love that. Right, yeah. But like, it took me a long time to figure that out. I'm like, oh, that's right. Because this is what 
This is people. this is what real boobs look like. Right, real, yeah. Right. This is what people look <laughs> they don't like. point up to the sky. Right. Every not every guy has giant muscles. You know, this guy is a guy I that know. eats he eats oiled he fish. He went with muscles on that one. Right. Exactly. But I was struck by the way they tell the story differently, and it's almost like learning a new language. Yeah. Because you're like, this whole movie it doesn't make sense to me the whole time. Mm-hmm. It's good. You can mm-hmm. tell that it it's good, but it's it's a foreign language. Mm-hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that and how how you have figured out translating those things? Just in terms of interpreting. Well, first of all, I have loved foreign films since I saw my first one when I was like seven. The first foreign film I saw, I shouldn't say that because I was watching foreign films and wasn't aware they were foreign films. Like I was one of those kids that watched like the Kung Fu Theater. Yes. The monster movie, like the Saturday monster thing. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, and a lot of those films, they were like Asian films. They were like either from Japan or from China. But at the time, I didn't think I didn't think of them as foreign films. They were just like my heroes, like martial arts. They always had women that were kicking butt too. So yep. in my mind, it was like those are the awesome movies. And then the monsters, I'm like Godzilla is like my secret monster boo. Everyone who knows me knows I love Godzilla. And what's not to love? I, you know, and any of the kaiju from all those movies from Monster Island, I love all that stuff. But the first time I ever saw like a foreign film that I, because you know, a lot of times when in the back in the old days, children, when we had to watch the phone TV. Whenever it came on, when it was programmed, you know, they would dub a lot of films. So a lot yeah. of films I was watching, I didn't realize they were foreign. Or the Americanized version. Yeah, of Godzilla, yeah, Where yeah. they inserted Raymond Burr in places. Right, right. <laughs> but the first foreign film, I bet you it was, I think it was KTLA, uh-huh. Channel 5 in San Diego, Black Orpheus, the Brazilian film. And it was the first time I saw a film where there were black people outside of the United States and outside of Africa. I had never seen anything like that. I think I was like six. Uh-huh. And it like shocked me. Like, Another there place is black, black people. There are black people who speak Portuguese? Right. And at the time, it was the first foreign That's film I saw. It was, because I actually had like the, the English subtitles, uh-huh. so I could actually hear the like. So I knew that right. these weren't regular black people. Uh-huh. Like these, like regular black, like I mean, black Americans are regular black people. But in my six-year-old mind, it was like, so this is a foreign film. So, and it's different. And the culture's different. And it's like different from where I'm at. So that struck a love for wanting to watch foreign films. Yeah, that's cool. And then later on in high school, I think the first one I paid money to go see, it might have been Cinema Paradiso. And I think I must have been like maybe 18 or 19. And after that, it was on Babette's Feast. So I actively started seeking out foreign films because even before I started thinking about doing film myself, it was just the idea of seeing the world and learning how more alike we are than we are different. Yeah. You know, that kind of thing. And how interestingly different. Oh, my God, are. yes. And it made me think, I want to travel the world. I want to see other people. And I, I want to see... live in those cool little places. Or just hear their narratives. Like, what is their stories like? When I tell film, especially in the Screenwriters Rant Room, when I tell filmmakers, like, please, as your homework, watch foreign films. Watch classic foreign films. Watch brand new things that are popping. And watch foreign films in different genres. I just think it's important, one... To make you a better filmmaker, give you a different perspective, but one just to make you a better human being, you know. Amen. You know, just to say, hey, there's some people who have some cool stuff out there, and I'm like, wow, you know. Especially when I was watching a lot of like Russian films. Yeah. You know, and when we were having the Cold War in the '80s and stuff, and everybody's all paranoid, I was yeah. more like, but I've watched Solaris. I've watched, you know, some great films from Russia. Like, I'm not going to fall for the pop- propaganda. Right. You know, and when you do that, I don't know. It just, it just. I don't know. It just makes you a better person. Yeah. You know, one of the things too, I wanted to thank you for is, is as a white dude, you, uh, and, but a white dude who respects and understands culture very well, I collect perspectives. Mm-hmm. I don't have a black perspective. I don't have uh, any of the other perspectives mm-hmm. automatically. I've got to grind that lens down, and mm-hmm. you helped me to do that. So one of the games my daughter and I play is we'll recast movies. Oh, you know? fantastic. We'll, like, yeah. Them or something like yeah. that. You know? And so like we wanted to redo... Smokey and the Bandit, and we thought oh it would be. God, I love hit, that movie. Yeah, oh no, it's so good. The soundtrack. Oh, oh yeah. God, I love and it. And I would love to do a prequel. That's a different conversation. But if we were going to recast Smokey and the Bandit, oh, if you did a prequel, who would you cast? Oh, I, well, okay, so we can do that. But I just, I just want to okay, say one part about if we redid it now with the chorus, all that stuff theme. I would love to, and I hate to type typecasting, but I think you'd be awesome at it. I would love to see Ice Cube as Sheriff U for Two Justice. That would be hilarious. Because <laughs> he's so got good. that face. I and mean, then his Ice son Cube. would have to be like a mulatto yes! dude. Yes! <laughs> like, but Ice Cube would be, Ice Cube is like, he has that face. Yeah. 
where he could just be like the sternest looking dude yeah. and then he can turn it on a dime uh-huh. and be kind of happy looking. Yeah. That is funny. Uh-huh. And then like when, when he says, I'm going to home punch your mom in the mouth, it'd be like, because his kid really isn't his right, kid. Right, right. And we all knew. Right. But like, it just comes on for a minute. It'd be awesome. Oh, God, I wish somebody would remake and Smoking I would love Bandit. And uh, I would love to see Bandit get pick up a dude and then they fall in love. Uh, just, just to make the whole make, make thing. Make it different. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Anyhow, so the prequel, I've been working on this. You've been working on a prequel for Smokey and the Bandit? That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Who will be Smokey? Well, you, I don't know if you need a Smokey. I think you just tell a story about Bandit, how he, he was a legend in the movie. Okay. So what does he do that's legendary? That's cool. You know, is he running shine? Is he doing something else? Maybe he does time. I don't know what it is, but I've been oh thinking my God. about how does he become the bandit? Bo Darvel. Yeah. Know? Yeah. I, you know, th- when those movies came out, like that made me just really, I think part of that too was like made me like being on the road. I think that's why I like driving so much because when we would do road trips, we didn't, we couldn't afford planes right. when I was a kid. So anywhere we went, we had to drive to get there. And you always ran by those truckers. And I've always, always that little kid in the car that would go do your little yeah. hand and they would blow. And I just thought, what a cool life. And so, of course, in all those Smokey movies, Smokey and the Bandit, and when you're yeah. watching the Bandit kind of having those truckers help him get away from yeah. all that stuff. Um, I don't know. It just made me just love the road or any movies that have anything to do with the road. Yeah. Like road movies, road trips, you know, truckers, mm-hmm. like those working class folks that that make the world run and we don't really realize that. Like, if we yeah. didn't have truckers moving stuff around, you wouldn't have to haul out the stuff that you got. Sure. You yeah. know? Oh, my God. Oh, you got to do a prequel. Yeah. I'm excited I'm now. <laughs> I'm like, who would I cast as the band? Like, who would I want to see? Who's yeah. hot right now? Who? Well, what age would you cast them? Would you go, like, younger or... If I did the prequel, it'd be younger. It'd younger. Be like, yeah, someone... And I always think Zac Efron, whatever he does. Uh-huh. He'd be awesome. And who could afford that? But someone like that, who's mm. like, like is really good looking, but turns yes. out they're really funny and charismatic. Right, right, you know? right. Because you need that. You need because Burt Reynolds is great looking, but yes. he also like didn't take himself too seriously. Right, right. right. Kind of a smarmy character. Kind yeah. of a. Oh, now you got me excited now. It's See? like, oh, I'm thinking about the soundtrack now, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. who could I put on that? A nice, good country rockabilly soundtrack, and oh. Yeah, he's got to do something impossible. Southbound and down, redone. Who could do Southbound and down one more time? Yeah. Mm -mm. Sorry, went off on our tangent on a smoking the bandit. Doing a prequel, prequel fan casting. Did I tell you that I wanted to see if we did a remake Uh of, uh, or even a reboot of Smoking the Bandit? That I want Ice Cube to be Sheriff Buford T. Justice, (laughs) and then I want his kid to be interesting. I want his kid to be really white, so that when he finally realizes that. You cannot be a You cannot be. Right. I'm going to go and punch your mama in the mouth. Like, uh-huh. they, like we would all it, know it the whole something. time. Right, right, right. Yeah. right. <laughs> yeah, he would have to be mixed. Oh, my God. That's so... Okay, you have to do it now. You yeah. put it, you've put it out in the world. Right. It's got to happen now. Yeah. And now you make me want to go watch some more foreign films. See? That's what mm. we do around here. You know, the first foreign film I saw might have had Sonia Braga in it. <gasps> was it the not because of the Spider Woman? I was don't it? remember, but it, no. It oh wasn't no, it's the, the one in Brazil where yeah. she was like, uh-huh. uh, "Was it something? Something his many wives or Dora?" It was a name, wasn't yep. it? The name of a character. Yep. Oh, what was that movie called? Uh, I love me some Sonia Braga. Mm-hmm. Oh my god! I'm just gonna say, mm-hmm. <laughs> does that do too? Oh my god, she was amazing. She is amazing. Yeah, she was just on Luke Cage. Was she just in Luke Cage? What she was she playing Luke Rosario Cage? Dawson's mom. Oh, that was Sonya Braga? Mm-hmm. Wow. Mm-hmm. I loved Luke Cage. It took a minute to get going for right. me. I couldn't get through that That minute. very first episode. The only thing that got me through that episode is that our friend um, Tommy McElroy had a song in that first episode. And it was performed by uh, Raphael Sadiq. Yes. Okay, I'm gonna watch this episode. Yeah, for me, the the, the thing that worked the that music. worked in Luke Cage wasn't Luke Cage himself. Like, mm-hmm. I don't really like that character. I, I like him. He's all right. Yeah. I liked all the characters around. Like, I liked all the bad guys. Yeah. Like, the bad guys are good. The bad guys were just too too good, and I almost yeah, feel like really I just wanted to follow guy. the bad guys. Yep. Every time they go back to Luke, I'd be like, Hey, Luke. Yeah, here's Luke again. Here's Luke. He's going to pick up some Here we shit. go. And let's get back to Here goes the other folks. Shit. As a superhero, though, he's got a neat, um, accessible kind of superpower. Mm-hmm. You know, he's not destroying things with his laser eyes right. and shit. He's picking up refrigerators and hurling them at people. Yeah. And that's what you want to do. You don't want to have laser eyes for a superpower. Yeah, how do you stop your laser eyes from burning through everything? Right. 
You know, oh, I just, sorry, man. like I looked at that coconut cake because it was really good. It yeah. looked nice. And I was like, ooh. Mm. And if you look at it lustfully, will yeah. it catch on fire? Yeah. Right. And what if he fell asleep and your eye just happened to kind of go open and just kind of doing its yeah, own thing? you have a dream mm-hmm. in your laser eyes yes. shooting and you cut your eyelids all to shrimp. Yeah. <laughs> like, ah, my eyelids. We are really thinking too hard on this. laser <laughs> eye. Mm-hmm. Shut up. <laughs> Shut up. Where did Superman's cold breath come from, too? <laughs> Uh huh. Like, is that a Mentos power? I thing, could or? see that Superman <laughs> would have Mentos really power. <laughs> strong breath, but why was it cold? Yeah. What What was his? Was it that stank that it was? It wasn't even hot stank. It was like a cold, cold stank. stank. <laughs> yeah. He had like a, a some kind of super refrigerant. <laughs> right. And this is where the like, greatest American hero. Uh huh. He did like didn't know how to use his shit. How does Superman figure out that he had cold breath, and how does he control it? And what did he fuck up figuring yeah. out that he had cold breath? Right. Exactly. Because the greatest American hero. You know, when you were when I was a kid and I would watch that, I would go, man, I want him to be strong and right. heroic and right. all that shit. And instead, he's just like, he got that. I'm just Ralph Inkley. Yeah, yeah. He's bumbling. He kind of goofy. Can't, can't stick the landing. He can't. Man, put put a comb through your crop, too. But it was endearing as a but, kid. Right. That's what, what ended up happening was you watch enough of it and you go, you know what? This is my guy right here. Right. And, you know, he's bumbling. I'm bumbling. Right. He can't stick the landing. Must be really hard to stick that landing. Right. And suddenly, you know, you give yourself space in your imagination for him to grow on you because he's the same as you. Yeah. And that's what I like about Luke Cage in his drastically, wildly different from me-ness. Mm-hmm. His superpower is he could pick up a, a refrigerator and throw mm-hmm. it at you. And that's what I'd want to be able to do. Like, I just want to pick up this refrigerator and hurl it at folks. Because sometimes people need a refrigerator thrown at them. Uh huh. They get out of pocket. Here comes the, okay, here comes Come the refrigerator. Here. You might get a refrigerator thrown <laughs> Here at comes you. the fridge. <laughs> mm-hmm. Good Lord. Yeah, don't think I work in the appliance store for no reason. Okay. <laughs> I work in the appliance store because people get wise. Okay. I'm glad that Luke Cage started to pick up after a couple episodes, but you're right. I really liked a lot of the characters around him. Um, well, I mean, I'm always interested in those characters that are always. I've I've always periphery. been attracted to the dark side. I'm always attracted to characters who are more anti-hero. We all like good heroes, but sometimes they just get a little dull. You know, I like them. Like one of my favorite TV shows that it's taken too long for it to hurry up and come back out is Into the Badlands. Uh huh. Because Sonny's character, he's not really a good dude. He has he does some good things on the side, but he's a bad guy. You know, and I love it when shows play with my emotions that way, where it's like they're kind of morally ambiguous. Those are the type of stuff that attracts me. Like uh, another great show that I love is Outsiders. And I love characters who are kind of just messed up and don't know, you know, they're just messed up. There's like a character on Outsiders called Sheriff Wade. And like he's like a he takes drugs, but he's a sheriff. And he's just like trying to hold his life together, taking care of his son and all this stuff. And he's just a hot mess. And I think I'm attracted to hot mess people. And hot mess character and dark characters who don't always toe the line. That's what I like about Hateful Eight. Mm. Because everybody in that movie was everybody was terrible. Yeah, I couldn't make it through that movie. Oh, I love. I hated that movie. I loved it. I I I haven't liked. I don't trust Quentin Tarantino anymore. It's like M Night Shyamalan. I don't trust him. No, no, no. He had one movie. That was it. He could have done it with Unbreakable, but he didn't tell us the story of. The unbreakable character becoming so strong. Like, he just, like, glossed over, like, oh, by the way, M- he's strong. M. Night is, like, my Lucy to my Charlie Brown. Yeah. I always try to give him a chance. Yeah. And no. I'll run up, and then it pulls it, and it's like, <sighs> I think the last thing I saw of his was, oh, uh, what was the last thing he did? Um, Not the one about the alien. I'm trying to remember what it was. It signs? It might have been, was it Signs? Mark Wahlberg? Yeah. Uh, that wait, Mark that, Wahlberg? That might have no. been it. Whatever the last... Yeah. thing it was that it was like his big thing and I I went when I, I'm not going to fall for it anymore I didn't go see the last Amber and I was done I was like you know what I don't trust you anymore so it's, to me it's almost like if you put his name above the movie I'm not going to see it yeah. yeah there's that new movie that he has coming out not going to see it what is it Spice Spicer don't, don't or whatever yeah it's not on the list and it's like when I saw the trailer, I'm like, oh, I might want to check it out because it looks like horror. And it's like, oh, here's a guy who has 23 personalities. And the 24th one is kind of sketchy. I'm like, okay, that's right up my alley. And then I saw the name on him. I'm like, yeah, no. His name is M. Night. Uh-uh. uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> Which is unfortunate. Well, because the, the village did it for me. And I'm like, don't, don't I was you done. tell me this is Greg Brady. I was done. Running around tricking people. Yeah. Greg Brady. Running, running around, around tricking, tricking people. people. I try. But you know what? I'll, but that's my problem. I always try to give people chances. And then they just break my heart. And just like you said, Tarantino, like, I went because, one, 
70 millimeter. Come on. Yeah. yeah. Big. Yeah. The old school colors. It was that. It was that. So I paid my little money to the IMAX right. big thing. They had to, they even gave us like the little fancy booklet to make you feel special. And yeah. I was mad. Uh, La Jolla, IMAX, y'all didn't have butter <laughs> for the popcorn. <laughs> Oh, no. And I was there the night before to try to buy a ticket, and y'all said it was sold out, and you had butter the night before, because I saw you putting butter. That's not even cool. I saw them putting butter on other people's things. So it's like, y'all knew we was coming the next day. That's not cool. You saw me pay my ticket to come back the next day, and I... and. They didn't have butter. I didn't have butter in my popcorn. I didn't even buy. I didn't even buy the popcorn. My friend bought the popcorn. I, I sat there mad. So sometimes if I don't get butter in my popcorn, that might color it a little bit. Sure. But no, that movie was. I was disappointed because Did you I was like Django. I was. I love Django. Did you really? And my friends who I hated it, it yeah. are mad at me. I loved it because it wouldn't end. <laughs> it was just the never-ending. I loved that it wouldn't end. Never, it it was just like, kept we going can end right here. Nope. nope. Yeah, we're gonna keep going. <laughs> we can go here. No. Nope. No, there's 49 more minutes. No, I I saw it like three times. Did you? And it caused such a huge rift in a lot of my friends. Some hated it. They did the Spike Lee route. Like, they hated it. And I thought, y'all need to understand what this movie is. I'll tell you what I thought the movie was. I, I So here's why I didn't like it. One, I don't like being preached at in a movie. Well, that's Quentin. And I've learned through my experience in watching filmmaking that, you know, when Whitey goes out and he shoots 100 Indians and all by himself and the Indians are all stupid, that that's bigoted, insensitive, mm-hmm. and wrong. So when you flip it, it doesn't make it mm-hmm. right. And I get why by the black audience would like mm-hmm. it because they get to have that moment and I get that I don't begrudge anybody that thing but I'm like the story sucks and it's just got this cartoonish nature to it make it a cartoon well I think it kind of was because it was like a, a hodgepodge of so many different genres you know it, like everyone says it's the western spaghetti western it's yeah. that like Italian over the top color saturation kind of weird stuff going on it's gothic horror it's it just had so much stuff going on and i think that's probably why i roll with that it because it's like this is the most ridiculous movie and it knows it's ridiculous so i'm just gonna roll with that but there was just moments where i was just laughing See, it's like when so mario van peters actually tried to sell us that he was moist <laughs> you know what i'm saying moist. don't come on man moist. Don't tell us your elbows wouldn't be ashy. And I think, you know what, and the thing that stuck me, I think that the thing that grabbed me and held me throughout a Django yeah. was the perplexed look on Jamie Foxx's face the whole entire time. Like, if you go back and watch that movie, the expression on his face is like the expression I have for any of the shenanigans that goes on in the United States, where I'm just sitting there like, do we, do we... Do we not all see the same thing? Like, is it like, you know, the emperor's clothing? Do, is no one else seeing what's going on, the craziness yeah. of it? And that's what, I think that's what hooked me into it, was that expression on his face the whole time. Because in his eyes, the whole, everything was absurd. Yeah. And so we just rolled with it. But I tell you what, the audience, there was such a huge demarcation line in the scene with the, the clan, uh-huh. where they're surrounding them in the valley, and they're arguing about the, his wife made, like, the clan. Now... We went with like a totally mixed audience. And I tell you, the black people laugh more than I think the white people did. Right, right. And we, and people were like looking at us like, is it okay to laugh? Can yeah. we laugh at that? I'm like, that shit was hilarious because it's the stuff that you know that they were talking about <laughs> during that time, you know, and it doesn't have like that huge gravitas. We laughed so hard, but I do remember like a lot of my friend, like my former students were like shocked. Yeah. They were like, Lisa, I can't believe you liked that movie. It was a disrespect. I'm like, look, it's Tarantino. Yeah. He's well, going to take you on Mr. Magoo's wild ride. Yeah. It's going to be so he's going to break some rules. Right. He's going to put too much stuff in the stew. Oh, he always is. Violence. And I'm he, fine with all he those He's a good edit it down. Yeah. Get that movie short. Oh, man. That's a pet peeve of mine. Oh. That's one of the things about the, uh, the arrival that I didn't like. Like, can you not tell this movie in 90 minutes, please? I mean, I don't mind a two-hour movie. But when I watch that stupid Jesse James movie that Brad Pitt made and they showed him riding the goddamn horse for 15 minutes, like, I get it. But it's it. Brad Pitt. He's yeah. gorgeous. Well, I'm going to pick my, little, the my first, little playback that's thing. That's the first computer. scene. Yeah. That's what they put up there for Brad Pitt. you got to have the 15-minute Brad on the horse scene. God, you couldn't even see it half the same <laughs> scene. Yeah, I, I don't tolerate a two-hour movie that's two hours from there. I will agree. I will agree. Some th- He needs some friends to tell him to edit, and nobody wants to tell T to yeah. edit. They don't want to tell him. That love scene with Antonio Banderas and Angelina Jolie where there was all that naked revelry, that was entirely too Wait, long, Wait, what movie too. was this? <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm just... I think you're just making I'm, I'm just bullshit. No, he's got I'm a movie sitting, going in his head right now. Oh, I'm, I'm sitting here. Bullshit. I was like, what movie no, was this? No, there was a movie where Angelina Jolie and Antonio Banderas went know. after it, and it was terrific. 
And they went after it naked as the day they were born. I'm trying to remember what and movie you know West what was doing there. It was great. And it was just long enough, but it could have been longer if it wanted to. Well, so it was an historical drama, wasn't it? Something. Yeah. What's, I don't know. Was there a bathtub I think involved? It was something Zorro like. Was it a, a bathtub involved? Uh, Her in the bathtub? Maybe. Okay. No, I think there was like a canopy bed. And it was like gauzy drapery hanging off the canopy bed. What was bed. the most recent like that. Western that just came out? Like, the most recent Western? It just came out. Oh, uh, Hell, Hell and High Water? Or? Either way, it was two hours plus. Like okay. two, uh, two hours, seven minutes, something like that. Like, no. Off the list instantly. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's too long. It's a Western. It's, t- yeah. Western's in and out, 90 minutes. minutes. Yeah. Just in and out. Get us to the. Did you go see. Oh, wait. Did you go see the Magnificent remake of Magnificent Seven? That's the movie. I didn't go see it because it's too damn long. <sighs> but it had those good looking men. No, that's great. If you want to go for the man porn thing, I, no problem with that. But I'm not going to go see that movie because it's too goddamn long. It's a Western. There's rules. <laughs> and if you're going to break the rules, like Unforgiven, you're allowed to break you're the rules. You're allowed to break the rules. Okay. But it's All not right. going to be the Unforgiven. Mm. Not going to be Unforgiven. Mm. Well, Lisa Bolakaja, we've had you for more than an hour. Oh, geez. We love you. And we're going to have you come on the show again. We only got to hey, love you more we, than we loved wait, you before you showed up. Wait, wait. You have to come. And then we have to get into like, uh, we'll get into some shenanigans. Okay. I'll All bring right. you some stuff that we got to talk about. Because since you guys are watching like the good films and other foreign stuff, we got to get into the good stuff next time. Okay. All right. We'll get I'm into down. the good stuff. We should all pick a movie for everybody to watch and then talk oh, about yes. those movies. Yes. And pick a movie. I'm going to pick a Sonny Chiba movie. Oh, God. <laughs> Sonny Chiba. Like <laughs> oh, God. Memories. Uh-huh. Yeah. I'm going to have to binge watch now. So, yeah. I was telling John he has Please to watch. Please come back. I yeah. will, yes. We'll have no, to come back. This is required. This is it's requ- amazing. I want, you know, I've seen you guys' shirts. I want to kind of, do you guys have a website? Oh, we'll you can buy me a, yeah. a Break It Down yeah, shirt? We'll, yeah, we're going to throw some up again. Everybody go listen to the Screenwriter's Rant Room. Yes. Where you sure. hear more of the lovely Lisa and her terrific opinions. Oh, my God. The shenanigans. And Hilliard and his damn ankles and calves. And his damn ankles his and calves. sexy calves. Uh-huh. Yeah. Cut it out with Stairmaster. Shenanig- I know. I know. Ah, the Good hell, the hell that my life is when I walk into his office. Mm-hmm. He's got like the, you see, he's got like his gym stuff he in does. the office. He's got yeah. his, bar, mm, just making my life a hell. That's all right. We try to be nice too. And you know, when fat dudes try to be nice, they bring like <sighs> hot dogs. And he's like, oh no, I'll just drink my water. And we're like, great. We're sitting here with our fat <laughs> and all that self-control and stuff. <laughs> yeah. No, you enjoy that food. You enjoy it.